Hi and welcome. My name is Amy Bryant of Parenting Beyond Punishment and here locally in Atlanta, Georgia, my practice is Wild Child Counseling. I just want to thank you for being here today for our parenting Q&A. If you have a parenting question, please feel free to ask a question down on the Q&A button down below. And I just want to welcome our special guests today. We have Kate Orson. Kate is a hand-in-hand -hand parenting instructor. She's also the author of Tears, uh, Tears Heal, How to Listen to Our Children. She lives in Switzerland where she teaches parenting workshops and offers consultations both in person and online. You can learn how to work with Kate at kateorson.com. Tiffany Noonan is a pediatrician, a certified parenting coach, and founder of Epic Parenting. She speaks and writes extensively to share her message and empower parents and caregivers to create deeply connected relationships with their children and help them develop a strong sense of worth, internal motivation, and empathy. You can learn how to work with Tiffany at epicparenting.org. Welcome, Kate and Tiffany. Thank you so much for joining me again today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited. Um, I think that these um, webinars, especially with people, just are so much more powerful. I feel more connected, and I think our viewers feel more connected because um, we can kind of chat and be real and laugh. Yeah, I mean, we were just discussing that behind <laughs> yeah. the scenes. I really like um, when we have engagement and we're talking back and forth. I think not only does our personality show through a little bit more, but it also helps um, everyone feel a little bit more connected, even the people watching that, you know, they're part of it and, you know, love to see them chatting on the side if yes. they're feeling compelled. <laughs> yes, me too. So welcome. Um, also, I think it gives people an idea if you're looking for a parent coach and Kate resonates with you or Tiffany resonates with you or I resonate with you, that's who you should work with. You should work with the person who you are like that person. I feel yeah. connected to that person. So. so critically important in that type yeah. of relationship that you, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Get, get that like vibe. if I get on your nerves, don't give me a call to work with me because I'll just get on your nerves more, <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, so welcome. Thank you for being here. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. We had a couple of questions. I flipped the wrong way. Um, in our um, event page, and so we're gonna start with there. And then if you have questions, please ask them in the Q&A and Tiffany and Kate and myself will respond accordingly. All right. So the first question is from a mom. She says, my five-year-old spends half her time with me and half her time with her dad and stepmom. We do not parent in the same style. I find that when she comes back to me after five days, there seems to be more whining fits screaming and upset at seemingly insignificant things. I try connecting with her, but that doesn't always help. I choose not to spank, though I have to admit I have resorted to a swift swat a few times and immediately I regret it. But she tells me her dad does spank and they use punishments. I am working hard not to punish, but I'm not 100% there. I'm sure this is confusing for her. How do I help her deal with two parenting styles? It's difficult to speak with her dad about it. So I really want to know what I can do to help her when she's with me. And that's a long question. So if y'all want more information, Kate and Tiffany, just ask. Um, so my initial thought on that is thinking about the things that we can necessarily control. So it's a difficult situation, right? It's, that sounds difficult for a five-year-old, even for an adult, if you're in one environment where there's one set of expectations for a, a significant amount of time and then you have to transition to a different environment it can take some transition time in that um, you are probably you can't control how dad's parenting right so if we take that off the table when things are easier to talk to him about you can sort of discuss your philosophies but as that's something that you can't control i agree how can you help her um, transition and my thought on that is really um, getting clear and being consistent in the way that you parent, the way that you choose to connect with her so that when she comes home um, to your house, there's a, a set understanding of what your family values are, 
um, how things go in your house, um, reminding and reassuring her that you don't do punishing and things like that and that you connect on a different level. And then she's five, so kind of maybe even exploring with her at a time when it's not feeling emotionally charged what can we do to help you transition back into this household? Like what would be something that when you come back home can be a transition time? I think about it even from like a, an adult in a career, right? So when I was practicing medicine and um, active in the practice all the time and sort of in that masculine energy and go, 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 I needed to create transition time to sort of mellow out and chill out on my way home. And if I didn't create that, then I was bringing a different level of stress and a different me to my household and to the people that I was with. So for me, creating a transition time to reacclimate to a different environment is kind of important and maybe discussing with her how that can be, sort of having a, a pattern where when she comes home, um, you guys always go to a certain park when she comes home and you sort of get into a playful mode or um, something along those lines to see what works for you guys. But um, being pretty consistent um, and working on what's triggering you yourself, but being consistent with the way you are so that she really has a security of knowing how things work in your house. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you, Tiffany. Yeah, I think that's some really helpful advice. And just a couple things that I might add is um, sort of when she comes home, like um, when she's feeling really upset, it's, it's just to, um, feel like you can just be with her when she's upset and just listen to the feeling and help her release those feelings and not feel like you have, I know like it's really tough because you feel like, oh, this situation is quite hard for her. And, but in those moments where she's upset, just to feel like you don't have to fix it the way you can help her like cry out the feelings and just be with her and offer her comfort. And, um, and that in those moments you can just, try and not stress too much about what you're going to do and just know that by listening to her that's kind of like the first to help her process the the transition and the, and the difficulties between the two two parenting styles and um and it is really tricky to talk to a partner about parenting or together or separate and, it, and if there's difficulties uh differences then that makes it even more different and um if, I don't know if Amy, if I can send some links of articles and resources later, because um, Hand in Hand Parenting is having a cool, a free teleseminar, I think in a few weeks, and it's called Parenting from Different Pages, which is, and two instructors are gonna give um, tips for when, when you parent really in different style. So that's a useful resource that might be good to have. That's a great resource, Kate, thank you. Um... Yeah, when we do the recording after this, remind me and I'll include it in our um, follow-up email and I'll put this on the recording on YouTube too, so thank you. Um, I agree, I think um, both of y'all said some important things. One of them is having something consistent for her to look forward to that, that she can expect when she comes home because that's sort of an ease into that transition. I know that I'm gonna get to connect with mom in this way. And then like Kate said, you know, really getting your expectations in line with what's going to happen. She is going to be more whiny when she gets home. She has had a lot of stress on her and she's coming home and she's with you and she's going, mom, I need to share this and unload this with you. And um, like Kate said, just being available to hold that space for her so that she can whine and be upset and, and know that you're fixing it by just listening. Um, and that, that is what you do. I was just going to read through it. Um, wh when you try to connect with her, it might seem like it's not working because she's crying more. That means it's working. When she starts to cry and to really release those feelings, it means that she is working them out and that's what she's doing to do it. And I'm, I'm sure Kate, um, Hand in Hand Parenting talks a lot about stay listening and just that power, that really healing power of being present and managing our own emotions. We get so worried, we're upset for our children, but managing our own emotional and physical sort of being so that we can hold the space for them. Yeah, and I think it just, it has occurred to me also for the mom to make sure that she's getting the support that she herself as the adult needs, because mm -hmm. it's not the easiest of situations. And for her to know that it's okay for her to have some support system that she 
um, feels like she can unload her emotions on and get her tears out and, you know, the, all the stress that's involved with that because it doesn't just work for kids. I don't know about you guys, but I personally, <laughs> um, a good cry or a good, you know, I have my own coach and I will leave like ranty type of messages in an attempt to then not bring it to other people yeah. that aren't in necessarily in that position. Mm-hmm. And it helps me at the end of the 15 minute boxer message talking into the phone, like, okay, I feel better now. And if I don't do that, then I'm going to bring it into another situation and amplify it. Um, so for the mom to really make sure that she, you know, it's at the end of the day, right? It's not ultimately the situation that anyone had probably been hoping for, but you can really create beautiful families regardless of what, um, where the parents are living, but being able to express your own feelings and emotions about that. So that it isn't all, you know, if there's any guilt on the mom's part or this, she shouldn't have to be going through this or any of those thoughts or feelings for her to be able to work through those that she, so that she's not having them triggered by the fact that her daughter's upset because her daughter's feelings aren't, aren't her fault. It's as it's her own, her own feelings so that she can separate from that is really important. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want to add anything, Kate, before we move to the next question? Yeah, I think, that's also a really important point, Tiffany. And I think that like sometimes I think when we have a certain feeling and we feel like we can't change a situation, like you feel like, oh, your your ex-husband is not gonna change his parenting. So there's nothing that you can do. I think the tendency is to bury the feelings because you're like, well, I can't change it. So I'm just gonna bury the feelings. And, and actually something that happens is when you do get the chance to talk the feelings through and and really express your frustration and your grief about the fact that he's parenting in this way that you really dislike. And sometimes that can, can create this little space in your mind where you suddenly get an idea like, oh, maybe I can do this or that there might actually be something that you can do, even though it seems like hopeless. So to really go towards those feelings with the support of another person is really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Because when you, when you change the way you're looking at things, the things you're looking at change, right? I mean, I think that's a pretty common saying. So, you know, when, when you get those feelings out, then it does create the space to say, well, what's positive? When do we connect? How can we kind of get this message across and really be able to come together? And there's resources for that too. Um, He needs to be on, bored with that but the less anxiety that she brings to the situation the more he may just energetically start to feel like he's on board because she's Mm. you know we get to change our world by changing ourselves sometimes that's the hardest way it seems like yeah (laughs) if i could just change this right If, if i could just change that person and that person and that person then my world would be perfect and it never works that way unfortunately (laughs) so unfortunately Right. right and we're all doing our own work so yeah. we're not pointing the fingers at any of y'all we're you know. no i'm speaking from <laughs> personal experience <laughs> everything i say is i've come by authentically and the you know by taking the journey first <laughs> right <laughs> and reminding myself often <laughs> right often like every webinar <laughs> yeah every webinar <laughs> Me too. um okay so um, we have one live question. Well, we have two live questions, but I, we'll answer one and then we'll go back to the, um, to the Q&A event. So CG says, um, I've been doing a lot of yelling lately. I'm not proud of it. I'm trying to change this by practicing mindfulness, but now my seven-year-old yells at me over everything. I don't know how to get her to stop. I know she's learned it from me and I don't know how to turn it around for our family. Okay, um, so one thing that springs to mind is that um, she probably has some feelings to process about um, the mother yelling at, at her. So um, something that can be helpful is just to, like, as well as stopping the yelling, obviously, is to, um, yeah, just to spend some time with her. You, you could start with maybe just spending one-on-one time with her, like being with her, like um, playing something at her, that she chooses to play like one-on-one quality time kind of strengthen the connection after after the yelling is one way to start and that kind of 
builds her sense of safety. So whereas when, when she was experiencing the yelling, she might have felt scared and threatened. This kind of gives her the idea, like, I'm safe now. And, and when she can play something that she chooses, then that's the way the children really feel empowered because it's like, okay, I'm the boss now. We're going to play Lego for like half an hour or something like that. So that's just a really simple thing that you can do, um, yeah, to yeah. start off with. And then another thing you could do is with yelling is um, something like to try and make it into some sort of game where she also gets to feel powerful. So rather than being like, um, you could be, you could be like, oh, we don't yell in our house or something like that. You might want to set a limit, but it also might be like that you feel a little bit hypocritical because you know that when you've lost it and felt angry that that you. Um, have reacted in that way. So you might want to kind of react in a way that uh, facilitates laughter and that releases the tension behind that yelling. Um, so for instance, if she starts shouting at you, you might be like, um, let me see, like pretending to be afraid, for example. So you'd be like, oh no, I'm gonna go and hide in the bathroom. I hope this yelling monster doesn't get me or something like that. So um, some kind of way of like, if she's yelling because she feels powerless and she's trying to assert her power then sort of giving her that power in play and any kind of general play where she gets to be the powerful one something that we call play listening um, with hands in parenting um, could be really helpful just to help her feel safe and confident and then as she releases whatever fear she had about the la about the yelling then she'll start to feel much better connected and and it will reduce yeah I love both of those tools so much. Yeah. Um, as I was listening to the question too, I also thought about, I mean, I think sometimes um, we don't think about being really authentic and vulnerable with our children on what it is that we're working through and sort of um, taking responsibility for our own actions. And I have found for um, my children are, are six and eight. So they're straddled around the age of her seven-year-old daughter um, that if I do ultimately end up yelling, okay, so the first thing is, okay, I recognize it's because I'm feeling frustrated. It's because I'm overwhelmed or because I'm tired. And in that instance, I will go back and say, hey, I realize I yelled. I just want you to know that had nothing to do with you. I was feeling, you know, I didn't get much sleep or I'm feeling tired and frustrated, but that's not the ideal way for me to express myself. And I just want to apologize for yelling and recognize that I want you to know that I'm working on not going to that um, when I'm feeling frustrated, but I want you to know that it really has nothing to do with you. And I'd really, you know, that in this conversation, like I'd really like for us as a family to work on communicating with each other without yelling because it, feels kind of scary and yucky to me, just like I'm sure it feels scary and yucky to you when I'm yelling at you. Um, so when, you know, so going back and owning your own reaction, owning your response and not in a beat yourself up kind of way and certainly never in a blaming them because it's never their fault that we yelled. It's, they could be driving us crazy, but it's our own loss of, um, of our control, right? Us getting out of our frontal brain and going into that emotional center, that is the cause of that. So going back and, and owning that like, okay, this is what was going on for me. That reaction isn't what I strive to do and owning responsibility for that. And then working like when she is yelling at you, like playing is great, but also, you know, sometimes just recognizing it and saying, I hear that you're feeling, I hear that you're frustrated and you're angry and you're yelling at me. Is there, you know, could we, communicate in another way that feels better for both of us and just see how that goes as well. But I have found taking responsibility for it um, and owning it. When I start to feel frustrated, I'll say to my kids, I'm feeling frustrated right now. I'm going to take a little bit of a break so that I don't get to that yelling thing, uh -huh. but always, always own my own crap <laughs> instead <laughs> of putting it on them because I don't know what stories they're creating. So I'm hoping that, you know, by saying, this was about me, this is what it was about, it wasn't about you, that they're not creating stories where I do something bad or I did something wrong because it wasn't them. Mm -hmm. mm. I really like both of those. Thank you. I think um, having that special time with them where when they're powerful helps them work out feeling powerless, right? And developing that sense of capability and power. Um, it, it helps them sort of 
process that scariness and then owning our own stuff. How powerful is that, that we say, you know what, I reacted poorly to you and this is my own stuff because I'm imperfect. Mm -hmm. I love those, all of those things I think are so important in this um, approach to parenting where we're really focused on long-term skills in that, in our relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I think self-care is a huge piece of this. If we're yelling or getting upset and we're having less fun in our lives and enjoying our children less, those are really like red flags. Something's going on and we need to take a minute and figure it out and, and more than a minute, but maybe in the moment we need to take a minute. Um, you know, so figuring out what you need, ways you can fold, you know, like realistic self-care into your everyday life. I'm not talking like you have to go take an hour or go on a weekend to treat, but, you know, taking one moment or one minute, for me, it's having like a quiet, hot cup of coffee and drinking it all the way to the bottom while it's still hot so I don't have to heat it up five times in the microwave. Like that's what it is. It's like that five minute cup of coffee. Um, that's just one of my self-care things if you don't like coffee it can be tea or whatever i i love that advice and i also i advise a lot of my clients to make a list ahead of time of things that they love and that just make them feel good yeah. that can be a broad variety of things it can be that cup of coffee it can be a bath from you know for oh, me yeah. a cup of coffee is great or drinking a cup of tea out of like just a fancy glass you know right. like not not like the like the free the free mug that you got from the bank when you joined up <laughs> but like something that makes you feel good or yes. lighting a candle so that you have this because in the moment when you're starting to feel overwhelmed sometimes it can be like and there's nothing I can do but if you have a list on your refrigerator of you know what this will make me feel good mm -hmm. right now there's a go-to list when I'm feeling empty and I don't even know what to do that I can look at something I thought ahead and said a cup of coffee, five minutes of a book, a walk outside, those little things that you can do and throw the big things on there too. Throw right. the massage, throw the other thing ideas on there that you can start to figure out how am I going to incorporate this into my life? Yes. Because the more time it seems when you're in, in it, that it's impossible. But honestly, I have found the more time I take to take care of myself, the more time I actually have in my day because I'm present and yeah. there are less arguments and things. And believe me, that took me 30, I'm 42 now. So that <laughs> took, I started to realize that about five years ago and I still fall, fall victim right. to it from time to time and that my own my own personal list helps me I'm like oh yeah. crap what am I gonna do and to, I uh, find my list changes right yeah. your needs mm -hmm. change your list changes but I I think having a list for your come up with a list with your seven-year-old like you know when she's not upset right like when y'all yeah. are playing a game or you're cuddled up reading a book together you know what I notice sometimes it's really you're having a really hard time and you yell and I want to know what I can do in that moment to help, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. writing down a list together, um, knowing also, what soothes you yeah. sensory, your, your sensory can really mm -hmm. help. Um, humming can help you. Humming can actually quietly can help bring down your daughter's overwhelm mm -hmm. unless it bugs her. And then of course it'll just make it worse. So you got to figure out what works for her. Yeah. Sensory tools are important. I've always said my, my youngest son is tactile and he has this um, pillow that he picks at. Um, and I can just sort of nonchalantly bring it into a circumstance that we're in and hand it to him because I know it will start to calm him down without ha it having to be some big conversation about like, here, do this. You need this. Yes. Um, I also had an amazing experience with my kids when I started doing this. So like I said, they're six and eight now. So going back to when they were two and two and four or two and three, they're 16 months apart, of discussing the like, I realize at the end of the day that I can be tired and sometimes I can be feeling overwhelmed. And those are the times that I yell, do you guys have any ideas of what I can do when I'm starting to feel that way? And at that young age, they were like, how about if you tell us that and then we'll come and we'll give you a give you a hug and I was like well how sweet is that so it got to the point that if I was because that does calm me down right like just yeah. cuddling with my kids is something that helps me yeah. and I could say gosh I'm feeling frustrated or they could say you look frustrated and they would just come and give me a sweet hug like yeah. no expectations nothing else involved 
So I look at it as, okay, your kids are going to get overwhelmed as kids. They're going to get overwhelmed as adults. I'm trying to teach my children, hey, I'm not perfect. It happens to me. How do I deal with it when I don't behave perfectly just as well? So I kind of like, I make it okay for myself because, well, at least that was a life lesson and how to like own your stuff when you didn't kind of have, hold it all together. Yeah. And really, like, it's okay to reach out for help. Hey, I'm having mm -hmm. a struggle. Help me figure out what to do. Yeah. You know, imagine if we really felt like we could reach out to our spouse or our friends or our co colleagues or whoever to say, I'm stuck. Mm -hmm. You know, what are some ideas to help me come out of this? Kate, do you want to add so anything? So powerful. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, pretty much covered it. I think um, there's an, there's one thing that Patty Whipler, she's the founder of Hands in Hand Parenting, and she recommends like lying down on the floor, like if you find yourself getting stressed, because it just kind of breaks the situation. Like if you're busy trying to, like I know for me that the times I, I get angry are those times that I'm stressed and I'm trying to do something and like trying to get out the door or something like that and lying on the floor if you can remember to do it at the time it just completely breaks up the moment and your kids might even be like what are you doing <laughs> but then it like lightens it up and yeah so so that's one thing and I think it's also good to remember that the fact that you're yelling although it makes us feel terrible when we do yell it's not our fault in that like obviously it's our responsibility to do something to fix it but it, it usually happens when we're stressed it it usually happens because because that's the way we were raised and, and that's what when we're stressed and can't think about how to parent and can't remember all those peaceful parenting books we've read or whatever then we just revert back to this angry angry parent so just um to know that to forgive yourself and to look for all the resources that you can find and um, yeah, try some some de-stressing and self-care for yourself in in preparation for those moments as well, as yeah. well as in the moment. Yeah, like things that you can do to talk through like why you're yelling and, and what's happening and to try and talk it through and then think about kind of, yeah, release whatever feelings are coming up for you, what really frustrates you and annoys you about your child, like what's making you stressed in your life and, kind of talk it through and hopefully that can help. I love um, what you said. I was trying to write it down that it's not your fault that you're doing it. It's just your responsibility to, to take care of it. Yeah. I think that's so powerful. Like we don't have to blame anybody, but we can still take responsibility. I think that's just lovely. So I wanted to repeat that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so Danielle asks, we have another five-year-old. She says, my five-year-old really plays up when getting ready to leave. He won't get dressed. He won't do anything unless it's the opposite of what you've told him. He's the third of four boys and knows how to push everybody's buttons. I like him so much. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not in it. I get it. I've been there. It's so frustrating. He's got his place in this world and he's going to make sure that everyone knows yes, <laughs> that yes. he is who he is. Um, my hearing that I found with my children when, and with the advice of the children, um, the people that I coach is that when you sort of have that strong will, I'm going to make a presence. I'm going to do the opposite of what you say, because I kind of want control situation. They're really making it playful and going playful and using the natural curiosity of children to sort of, I don't want to say get your way, but at times that can kind of be what's happening. Right? So when my son refused to brush his teeth, you know, at the age of three, he can't help but respond to me saying, you know, if we can brush your teeth upside down okay like he doesn't want to brush his teeth but brushing my teeth upside down kind of sounds intriguing and fun so I'm not opposed to hanging a three-year-old you know over my shoulders and brushing <laughs> teeth to get the teeth brushed like just instead of saying it needs to look a certain way starting to figure out how we can make it playful or talk you know they have these great imaginations so and they like secrets, right? They're horrible at whispering. So everyone knows their secret, but they like these <laughs> secrets and they like playing. So, you know, starting, I would start having conversations with stuffed animals and be like, 
what do you think teddy bear oh you think he knows how to get himself dressed in his pants i don't know i'm not sure that he's old <laughs> enough yet you really do think it while i'm having that conversation not talking to my child or i'm having a whispering conversation that he can overhear which he can relate to he's like giggling and getting dressed in the corner, right? Because he's going to prove mom wrong. They love to prove us wrong. So he's going to prove me wrong. And it's, it's, it makes it fun and playful. Um, and realizing that a lot of the like little things we're getting stuck on, it's because we're attached to the way that it looks. And it's when we're willing to be like, let me s just think about the mind of a child and how can I get into the mind of a child and kind of play with it? Um, I found it easy. So brushing teeth outside, brushing teeth upside down, getting dressed because the teddy bear thinks you can and you can't. But um, playing with it, I have found to be just a huge stress relief for everybody rather than making it this like power struggle that escalates because the will of a five-year-old is greater than the, <laughs> than, the, than the will of the parent very often. And then we resort to like, okay, I'm going to control you because I'm bigger because they're going to keep going. And um, when everyone plays and laughs, it just doesn't have nearly as much weight to it. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think play is totally brilliant for sure. <laughs> Go ahead, Kate. Yeah, I agree totally. Like with this not getting ready thing, like trying to get out the door, play is the only <laughs> only way to go really. Yeah. And um, uh, yeah, like I... Um, on my website, which Amy will be sharing later, I have this thing called, uh, I called it Giggle Parenting, but it's actually my own name for this um, tool from Hand in Hand, which is called Play Listening. And that's like giving your child the power um, and making them laugh. And, and I have tried to write blogs for like, I don't know, I must have at least 30 different parenting challenges and a way to use laughter. So for instance, yeah um another one with getting dressed is like for instance like you can even set this one up the night before so you could like get your child's outfit that you want him to put on in the day and then line up some cuddly toys and like have them put on each each item and then when you get up in the morning together you could be like oh like let's go and get dressed now or go and get dressed and then you like act all surprised and confused that all the cuddly toys are wearing the clothes and then you're like the kind of befuddled confused parent and he's like laughing and laughing like I'm not getting dressed all the toys are wearing my clothes and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and those sorts of scenarios can help like getting some laughter going like it's just ama it's just amazing like when your child is in non it can seem like well I just want to get out the door I don't have time for these games but but when you try them like you, you can go from like a sulky child to a cooperative child within like a few minutes and yeah so just like figuring out some way that you can get your child giggling and um incorporate that in your morning routine which which is difficult when you've got four children but just to try it and and see how it works and and see how effective it can be yeah and a five-year-old's capable of getting themselves dressed so again sometimes when they can sort of prove us wrong sometimes so you know if you're in the middle of doing something and yelling into the room you know hey, whatever, I know you don't like getting yourself dressed and I need to help you get dressed this morning. I'll be in a couple of minutes because I, you know, I'm sure you're not going to take care of that on your own. Then they like to come out fully dressed and be like, you didn't know that I did this. You know, like, I don't know. Like my, my son's kind of like, and then being like, wow, what a surprise. I so appreciate it. You know, just really giving them that positive affirmation for what it is that they've done. And in really stressful, like, in just, it's just not working. I've had people say, you know, like, what's the big deal? Like have your kids sleep in their clothes <laughs> and it's getting down to it. I'm like, do you want to sleep in your clothes tonight so that you're ready for tomorrow? Because we can totally do that and take it off the table. Uh -huh. Like, does it have, what do they, do they need to sleep in their pajamas? Like where, where is the stress level um, coming from and how can we kind of remove that circumstance? So if the play is falling on deaf ears and you're at a stretch and you know you need to get up and go in the morning you can be like hey I mean I do this when we do family trips like if we're getting up to travel at like four o'clock in the morning or driving somewhere I have the kids sleep in their t-shirt and whatever not even because they'd resist it so much it's because I all of us are tired and I don't want them to get dressed so sleep in your clothes before we um get on the road at some crazy early hour 
Yeah, I think especially if the issue is sensory, some kids mm -hmm. don't want to go from warm, cozy to like cold clothes. Yeah. It's totally okay for them to sleep in their clothes. Eventually their body's not going to be so sensitive. It won't be such an issue. Mm -hmm. um, some kids really like, it, it so depends on if your child is being strong willed or resistant because they feel disconnected or because they want power so mm. if he wants power you could create a chart with him we're like okay mornings are hard what is it all that we need to do right and he can cut out pictures or draw pictures or whatever and you just write down everything he needs to do or that he tells you what do you need to do um you know and he might be like i need to play cars and you write down cars and i need to blow my nose blow my nose i mean you just write it all down i need to go spin in circles and hold up my left pinky and belch okay you know you just <laughs> write it all down this is and i the goal is to make him feel connected and heard and powerful which goes back to what we had said on an earlier one and then let him really create that chart and hang it up someplace. And then in the morning, you don't even have to tell him what to do. You just go, mm -hmm. okay, I'm trying to remember what I need to do today. Oh, yeah, I need to have a quiet cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> you know, what's on your list? You know, so you're just directing him back to that list so he can do it himself. And then he, and then, you, you know, you see he's playing cars or you see he's twirling and holding his pinky up and you go, oh, good, you're doing the twirly pinky thing. What's next? Right. Mm -hmm. And the idea is you're taking yourself and your power because we are so big to little kids and we are so powerful to little kids that if we can take our bigness and our power away and get small and allow them to be big and powerful, it can be so empowering for them. Yeah. Um, but also, I am a, the other thing I'm curious about is, how are his mornings starting? Are they starting loud, fast, go, go, go? Because um, it may be that he needs a slightly quieter, slower morning. Can you wake him up by crawling up beside him and cuddling up and saying, it's time to get up? You know, even if you need five extra minutes to do it, it doesn't have to be forever. It's hard when you have three children, but just to begin to break into that resistance that he's feeling. Climb in bed, rub his back, it's time to get up. So it's sort of sensory soothing, it's connecting, and then where do you want to start on your chart? You know, where, what picture do you want to start with? You know, and really start with that connection right off. Okay. My guess is he's feeling disconnected. And then if there's a sensory issue, you can address that or if there's a power issue you can address that too and speaking to the power issue too so we all, most often we don't like being told what to do right so when as the parent we're kind of getting things done and we're directing them at that age i found making a playlist of music like they get to pick their songs and it's sort of transition points so you've got your chart that they've got that you have and it sort of works out with the idea that, you know, with each new song, you're doing a new task and that they, they can keep themselves on board. So they pick their playlist and they make their chart up together. And then mom doesn't have to say it's time to be doing this. It's a new song. It's the next step. And so mom isn't the one who's sitting there saying, did you brush your teeth yet? Where are your shoes? I don't see your bag. <laughs> Cause yeah, think about it. Like the size that we are to a five-year-old, imagine somebody standing like on someone else's shoulders, but that being the size of the human that's talking to you, mm -hmm. it's, um, it could definitely be a little, um, we're big. We're big. <laughs> yeah, we're big. I love that. Where the, yeah. the music that they love is telling them to do the next thing. That's yeah. Funny. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait to share that with my daughter tomorrow. She's going to love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kate, do you want to add anything before we go to the next one? Um, well, I think that's pretty much it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is another live question. Again, if you're here and you want to ask a question live, there's a Q&A section. If you just want to chat, chat with us, um, there's a chat box and we'll do our best to keep up with both. Um, so Serena asks, um, I have three children, ages six, four, and 18 months. The older two love each other and have times where they play excellent together. However, my son, who's six, will often lose patience and scream at his sister, who's four, who will then lash out by hitting. 
how can I patiently deal with this and what are good ways to help them to deal with each other in kinder ways. I'm honestly also struggling with my yelling so I could stand some advice on how to find my own calm. Not making excuses, but I'm a stay-at-home mom, so I'm in the midst of these small people 24-7. So patience is often not my strongest suit. So let me recap. Three children, the four and your six-year-old play well together, but then they're screaming and hitting, and um, how can they play be kinder? And then the second kind of part is help me stop yelling. Okay. The help me stop yelling part, just to start with that, I think we've already touched upon that. I mean, you're a stay at home mom and you are, you're an adult who's spending probably 24 seven in the company of young people. And that doesn't always lead to the most engaging of conversations. Um, so working on making sure that you have things in your life that you still love to do that you love to do before you had children before you were married that still like makes you I'm sorry I don't remember what her name is here but let's, Serena. Serena so that you know keeps you in touch with Serena Serena pre-mom Serena pre-wife but who is Serena the woman and sort of adding those into your days so that you're finding your fulfillment it our children don't have to be our sole fulfillment. And I think when we actually expect that, well, we're a mom, we should get all of our fulfillment from this situation. Um, we're setting ourselves and our children up for some complicated relationships because you were a human being for many, many years before you became a mom and still being able to own that part of you will help with that. that. So it, that can be with three kids joining a local play group where the parents sit around and drink coffee while the kids are at a playground. Or it could be you, if you loved to dance, still saying, hey, I need the support of being able to go to dance class once a week or whatever it is so that you're still getting your like you time in there it goes so long, so far in helping you be human. I am, you know, I have a business and a job. I have a business plus I work from home plus I homeschool my kids. And there can be times I'm like, I just need to talk to an adult and not actually be in the coaching capacity at the same time. Like, I just want to like hang. And if I am not getting that, then I start to get ornery with everybody. And my kids will tell me I need to go meditate, right? They're like, mom, you're being a little grumpy. You might need to go meditate. And I'm like, I think mom, mom actually needs to go play. <laughs> mom, whatever that might be, mom needs to go take a walk in the park or mom needs to meet a friend um, and just hang out and be me. So that's my, my advice in the like losing your own stuff, just because you're not really nurturing you're, it seems so cliche, but if your cup is empty, it's just hard to give it to other people. Um, as far as the children fighting, I mean, siblings are going to, you know, they're together all the time. There's going to be times when they get on each other's nerves. So, um, you know, that happens for everybody in close relationship. At times, we're not going to be getting along. So the way I um, handle it, one of our family values that my children are aware of is respect. Um, we talk about our family values all the time, not just when we're talking in a difficult situation. So when I find them having complicated connection, you know, complicated relationship or connection, or they're disconnecting with each other, um, at that age, I step in, but not in a figuring out what to do. I've actually explained to my children, it's not... I can't take the responsibility of figuring out who is right or wrong in this situation. That's not fair to me because I love you both and you both have your sides and there's probably nobody who's all right and one person who's all wrong. Like you each have your own perspective. So I stop it and I say, okay, respect is important in our household. I see that you guys are having a disagreement, but hitting and yelling isn't respectful. So why don't we sit down for a second and I'll say, child number one, what are you feeling? And they'll start with some blame, blame talk right? Because they're not going to tell me what they're feeling. They're going to tell me, well, he did this and he did that. And I say, I hear you, but I'm asking you, what are you feeling right now? And what are you wanting? So I'm feeling frustrated. I'm wanting to play with the toy. Great. Child number two, what are you feeling right now? What are you needing? I'm feeling this. I'm needing that. Okay, wonderful. Now we know what each people are feeling. How do you think we can come together and you can both meet those needs in a way that you both are getting what you need and what you want and it isn't a disagreement. So a lot of times that comes together with, we'll, I'll play with the toy for five minutes and then I'll play with the toy for five minutes. Okay, we respectfully resolved our conflict. We've created a win-win solution and then we move along. 
um, this is a conversation at that age that I really, um, I kind of have to moderate, right? When they were that age. And now it's more at the point where I can say, you guys are having some conflict. How do you think you want to work that out? Can you guys have a conversation about what you're mm -hmm. feeling and needing and creating a win-win solution? And they very often take it on their own now. Mm -hmm. I never, ever assume responsibility for figuring out who's right or wrong in conflict. Mm -hmm. It's just not fair. Right. Yeah. yeah. Go that's ahead, Kate. A, that's a really interesting idea. Yeah. Um, and it's amazing, like, when, our, when we give our children the kind of space to be heard and to have their feelings heard and their and their thoughts about it they can often come up with some really mature suggestions when we just create that space for them um, one one thing um about the hitting is that often like children often well, i mean they always know that hitting is wrong and what happens in those moments is they 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 get angry they get frustrated and it can often trigger a kind of um powerlessness inside of them so it's like they need to like they feel like they need to assert their aggression and often in those moments they're not really thinking it's like their emotional brain has taken over their thinking brain isn't working so it's often like they can't remember what you've told them about how we don't hit in this house in in that moment so um one thing that you can do a preventative thing is to kind of notice when things are escalating and often at that time they actually it, like you it sounds great that your children are like playing well together and having a good time and something a little change that could be really powerful is to notice the moments when they're starting to whine a bit and get frustrated with each other and either perhaps you notice the girls behaving in a certain way or the boys behaving in a certain way that you think uh oh this is a sign that things are going to escalate and to move in right away and give them some kind of connection. Like one thing that you could do is like, if they're fighting about a certain toy, for example, you could like take another random toy and be like, this is the toy I'm playing with. I don't want anyone to take it from me. And then they might start fighting you for the toy and then they join forces to fight against you. And then as they're laughing and having fun, they're feeling more connected to you so then they they can think better in themselves because they've got that sense of connection that they need to have all the parts of the brain working well and and that can be a preventative way just, and just to step in and also if you're if you think things are es escalating is to kind of um Patty Ripfler, the hands in hand parenting founder she calls it like a friendly patrol like if you notice that that things aren't quite right then it's just to kind of be there and if you you can even like intercept a child like if they're about to hit the other like intercept them and just take their hand gently before they hit their sister obviously this doesn't always happen we can't be there all the time but if you can sometimes what will happen is like your child you just take their hand and you'd be just like i'm sorry you can't hear blah 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 and then they might start laughing and trying to escape from you like if you really are warm and connected and give them eye contact so they know they're not in trouble they're not being shamed or anything like that then they might start laughing and what can even happen is that they might actually start crying and because they feel your warmth of connection all those feelings that were going to go into that act of aggression will be let out because you've been there to to listen so that's the possibility i like all of that the um just uh whatever i can remember so <laughs> tiffany talking about how and this is all sort of about how our brains and our bodies connect as parents and how our children's brains and bodies connect and then how their brains are responding to us as parents we need to play and we need to take care of ourselves. And even if we can only find two or three minutes here and two or three minutes there, you know, if you don't have support or a partner or, you know, family who can help you, it is about folding it in in two or three minutes. But having that list, so when you find that you've got like an hour and you're like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I don't want to just watch Netflix or sit on the couch and scroll through Facebook because that's kind of what we do. And, all and do like, not do the dishes at that time. <laughs> Right. No, no. I guess I'll just do the dishes. Exactly. You know, like, go to that list and find something. You know, like 
just to divulge something personally, I turned 44 a few months ago and my husband bought me a um, skateboard. Um, and I'm, I'm 44. It is so fun. I'm not going to lie. Um, like when I'm feeling super stressed out, I'm like, I'm going outside to skateboard. We've got this teeny tiny little hill that anyway, I'm like, anyway, it's so fantastic. And I feel like I'm playing and like, I'm not trying to be young. I'm literally just going out and playing and it just feels good. So my family would think I was suicidal and I'm pretty sure I wouldn't make it to my next birthday. Oh, well, I fully but good for you. An arm any day now. I'll come yeah. to you, Tiffany. Yeah. Um, but it is really fun. So finding just like one thing that's real, I can literally go outside and walk up the hill. And I mean, it's a teeny tiny hill. I am not a skateboarder, even though I think it's fantastic. And like, I come down, I go back up, I come down and like 10 minutes, boom, I'm done. Okay, sorry, I was getting a little freaked out, but it's just some fun little thing to do. Um, yeah. I uh, took, it, and my own divulging, I took a pole dancing class. It was just, I mean, um, oh hard work, hard work. But I mean, it's, that's just sort of way to get out of like being mom mode, right? So right. You're trying, trying to learn how to fly. Um, yeah, just those <laughs> Something things. Something that you think is fun. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and, and even if it's like, I'm going to go get in a hot bath for 10 minutes, you know, y'all can sit around and clamor around me if you need me, but I'll be in the bathtub. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so finding ways to take care of yourself that feel good are so important. And then understanding like siblings are going to fight and friends are going to fight. And that's how they build a relationship. They're not really being unkind to each other. It feels like that to us because that's our perception. They're learning about themselves and their relationship. And if you can move in in these um, collaborative problem solving ways where you're just there holding the space while they figure it out, you know, you're just there as support, to help them say what they feel. Um, you don't have to solve the problem and you solving the problem and finding out who's wrong or who's right, that just breaks apart their relationship. But when you're able to hold space so that they solve it, it nurtures their relationship. Um, and it's just lovely. Um, we are out of time. That went so fast. Um, let me click done on this. So do y'all want to add anything else to that? Um, I just thought I had is just for people to remember that emotion is literally like energy and motion, right? So it's okay to be expressed. It's okay. You know, hitting in your household is probably not the way you want to express anger or frustration, but hitting itself isn't necessarily a bad thing. If you're hitting a pillow or a punching bag or other ways to like motor that, that feeling out. So just remembering emotion is all good and expressing it is, is the healthiest thing for our bodies for it to not sort of get stuck in there um, to energy in motions emotion so it's okay to cry it's okay to be frustrated it's okay to hit something but then setting the boundaries of okay hitting each other probably not ideal I don't know if anyone has had an actual physical as an adult like temper tantrum but I was instructed to do that at one time you like lay on the bed and like bang or whatever and I was like holy crap, I think I should have been having, I should have had that probably since I was five years old, right? I didn't right. have temper tantrums. I was a very compliant five-year-old. And I was like, once I actually like stopped feeling really silly, it, the next day, the sky was blue. I'm telling you right now, the sky was bluer. The birds were chirping louder. It was just getting these emotions out. It's really a good, it's really healthy and a really a good thing for your children, even when it feels like I don't know what's going on right well, here. Trust that they yeah. they aren't blocking it and it's really working mm -hmm. for them and then helping them find ways to do it that are um, not gonna damage someone else. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Tiffany. Yeah. Kate, you wanna leave people with something? No pressure. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <that means it. laughs> um, uh, yeah, I guess, I really like this idea of doing something that's fun, that we, I think in our culture, we have this idea that we've got to be very serious as adults and stuff. So yeah, just to try something. I know we've been chatting a bit about it in the chat box as well, is just to, to do something that's fun, that might seem a bit silly to you, but just to 
feel some kind of joy and, and maybe just to try to do one thing this week that you wouldn't normally do to add in a little bit of extra joy and just notice how it affects your parenting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I love that. Don't go <laughs> crash on a, on a skater, skateboard or rollerblades or anything and be like, Amy <laughs> told me to, or Kate told me to, or Tiffany. Yeah. That's sort of my inner voice right now is what would be fun right now. Whenever yeah. anything's not feeling great, what would feel fun right now? Yeah. yeah. Yes. It's so important. It's okay to let fun take a priority. Yeah. Sometimes. One of our, it's actually one of our family values. My son was three when he chose it and I thought it was great. And he reminds me of it. I love when, it. When we're not having fun, but fun is a family value. It, I love it so much. Yeah. Might have to create a poster for that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Tiffany and Kate so much for joining us. This was fun. I really enjoyed having you both here and thank you for joining us in this call. I hope you got your questions answered. You can find Tiffany at epicparenting.org. You can find Kate at Kate Orson, O-R-S-O-N.com. You can find me at parentingbeyondpunishment.com or wildchildcounseling.com. And uh, thank you for being here. <laughs>